chapter nine of when the holy ghost is come this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen when the holy ghost is come by samuel logan bringle chapter nine the meek and the lowly heart ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you i know a man whose daily prayer for years was that he might be meek and lowly in heart as was his master take my yoke upon you and learn of me said jesus for i am meek and lowly in heart how lowly jesus was he was the lord of life and glory he made the worlds and upholds them by his word of power john one hebrews one but he humbled himself and became a man and was born of the virgin in a manger among the cattle he lived among the common people and worked at the carpenter's bench and then anointed with the holy spirit he went about doing good preaching the gospel to the poor and ministering to the manifold needs of the sick and sinful and sorrowing he touched the lepers he was the friend of publicans and sinners his whole life was a ministry of mercy to those who most needed him he humbled himself to our low estate he was a king who came lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt the foal of an ass zachariah nine nine he was a king but his crown was of thorns and a cross was his throne what a picture paul gives us of the mind and heart of jesus he exhorts the philippians saying let nothing be done through strife or vain glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves and then he adds let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross now when the holy spirit finds his way into the heart of a man the spirit of jesus has come to that man and leads him to the same meekness of heart and lowly service that were seen in the master ambition for place and power and money and fame vanishes and in its place is a consuming desire to be good and do good to accomplish in full the blessed the beneficent will of god some time ago i met a woman who as a trained nurse in paris nursing rich english-speaking foreigners received pay that in a few years would have made her independently wealthy but the spirit of jesus came into her heart and she is now nursing the poor and giving her life to them and doing for them service the most loathsome and exacting and doing it with a smiling face for her food and clothes some able men in one of our largest american cities lost their spiritual balance cut themselves loose from all other christians and made for a time quite a religious stir among many good people they were very clear and powerful in their presentation of certain phases of truth but they were also very strong if not bitter in their denunciations of all existing religious organizations they attacked the churches and the salvation army pointing out what they considered wrong so skilfully and with such professions of sanctity that many people were made most dissatisfied with the churches and with the army an army captain listened to them and was greatly moved by their fervor their burning appeals their religious ecstasy and their denunciations of the lukewarmness of other christians including the army she began to wonder if after all they were not right and whether or not the holy spirit was amongst us her heart was full of distress and she cried to god and then the vision of our slum officers rose before her eyes she saw their devotion their sacrifice their lowly hidden service year after year 
among the poor and ignorant and vicious and she said to herself is not this the spirit of jesus would these men who denounce us so be willing to forego their religious ecstasies and spend their lives in such lowly unheralded service and the mists that had begun to blind her eyes were swept away and she saw jesus still amongst us going about doing good in the person of our slum officers and of all who for his name's sake sacrificed their time and money and strength to bless and save their fellow-men you who have visions of glory and rapturous delight and so count yourself filled with the spirit do these visions lead you to virtue and to lowly loving service if not take heed to yourselves lest exalted like capernaum to heaven you are at last cast down to hell thank god for the mounts of transfiguration where we behold his glory but down below in the valley are children possessed of devils and to them he would have us go with the glory of the mount on our faces and lowly love and vigorous faith in our hearts and clean hands ready for any service he would have us give ourselves to them and if we love him if we follow him if we are truly filled with the holy spirit we will a captain used to slip out of bed early in the morning to pray and then black his own and his lieutenant's boots and god mightily blessed him recently i saw him now a commissioner with thousands of officers and soldiers under his command at an outing in the woods by the lake shore looking after poor and forgotten soldiers and giving them food with his own hand like the lord his eyes seemed to be in every place beholding opportunities to do good and his feet and hands always followed his eyes and this is the fruit of the indwelling holy spirit have ye received the holy ghost since ye believed end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of When the Holy Ghost Is Come. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. When the Holy Ghost Is Come by Samuel Logan Bringle. Chapter Ten. Hope. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Are you ever cast down and depressed in spirit? Listen to Paul now the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the holy ghost romans fifteen thirteen what cheer is in those words they ring like the shout of a triumph one god himself is the god of hope there is no gloom no depression no wasting sickness of deferred hope in him he is a brimming fountain and ocean of hope eternally and he is our god he is our hope two out of his infinite fullness he is to fill us not half fill us but fill us with joy all joy hallelujah and peace three and this is not by some condition or means that is so high and difficult that we cannot perform our part but it is simply in believing something which the little child or the aged philosopher the poor man and the rich man the ignorant and the learned can do and the result will be four abounding hope through the power of the holy ghost and what power is that if it is physical power then the power of a million niagaras and flowing oceans and rushing worlds is as nothing compared to it if it is mental power then the power of plato and bacon and milton and shakespeare and newton is as the light of a firefly to the sun when compared to it if it is spiritual power then there is nothing with which it can be compared but suppose it is all three in one infinite and eternal this is the power throbbing with love and mercy to which we are to bring our little hearts by living faith and god will fill us with joy and peace and hope by the incoming of the holy spirit god's people are a hopeful people they hope in god with whom there is no change no weakness no decay in the darkest night and the fiercest storm they still hope in him though it may be feebly 
but he would have his people abound in hope so that they should always be buoyant triumphant but how can this be in a world such as this we are surrounded by awful mysterious and merciless forces that at any moment may overwhelm us the fire may burn us the water may drown us the hurricane may sweep us away friends may desert us foes may master us there is the depression that comes from failing health from poverty from overwork and sleepless nights and constant care from thwarted plans disappointed ambitions slighted love and base ingratitude old age comes on with its gray hairs failing strength dimness of sight dullness of hearing tottering step shortness of breath and general weakness and decay the friends of youth die and a new strange pushing generation that knows not the old man comes elbowing him aside and taking his place under some blessed outpouring of the spirit the work of god revives vile sinners are saved zion puts on her beautiful garments reforms of all kind advance the desert blossoms as the rose the waste place becomes a fruitful field and the millennium seems just at hand and then the spiritual tide recedes the forces of evil are emboldened they mass themselves and again sweep over the heritage of the lord leaving it waste and desolate and the battle must be fought over again how can one be always hopeful always abounding in hope in such a world well hallelujah it is possible through the power of the holy ghost but only through his power and this power will not fail so long as we fix our eyes on eternal things and believe the holy spirit dwelling within turns our eyes from that which is temporal to that which is eternal from the trial itself to god's purpose in the trial from the present pain to the precious promise i am now writing in a little city made rich by vast potteries if the dull heavy clay on the potter's wheel and in the fiery oven could think and speak it would doubtless cry out against the fierce agony but if it could foresee the purpose of the potter and the thing of use and beauty he meant to make it it would nestle low under his hand and rejoice in hope we are clay in the hand of the divine potter but we can think and speak and in some measure understand his high purpose in us it is the work of the holy spirit to make us understand and if we will not be dull and senseless and unbelieving he will illuminate us and fill us with peaceful joyous hope one he would reveal to us that our heavenly potter has himself been on the wheel and in the fiery furnace learning obedience and being fashioned into the captain of our salvation by the things which he suffered when we are tempted and tried and tempest tossed he raises our hope by showing us jesus suffering and sympathizing with us tempted in all points as we are and so able and wise and willing to help us in our struggle and conflict hebrews two nine to eighteen he assures us that jesus into whose hands is committed all power in heaven and earth is our elder brother touched with the feeling of our infirmities hebrews four fifteen and he encourages us to rest in him and not be afraid and so we abound in hope through his power as we believe two he reveals to us the eternal purpose of god in our trials and difficulties listen to paul all things work together for good to them that love god we know this says paul romans eight twenty eight but how can this be ah there is where faith must be exercised it is in believing that we abound in hope through the power of the holy ghost god's wisdom and ability to make all things work together for our good are not to be measured by our understanding but to be firmly held by our faith my child is in serious difficulty and does not know how to help himself but i say leave it to me he may not understand how i am to help him but he trusts me and rejoices in hope we are god's dear children and he knows how to help us and make all things work together for our good if we will only commit ourselves to him in faith thou art as much his care as if beside nor man nor angel lived in heaven or earth 
the sunbeams pour alike their glorious tide to light up worlds or wake an insect's mirth again afflictions overtake us and now the holy spirit encourages our hope and makes it to abound by such promises as these our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal two corinthians four seventeen eighteen but such a promise as that only mocks us if we do not believe in all their affliction he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity he redeemed them and he bare them and he carried them all the days of old isaiah sixty three nine and he is just the same to-day to some he says i have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction isaiah forty eight ten and nestling down into his will and believing they abound in hope through the power of the holy ghost he turns our eyes back upon job in his loss and pain upon joseph sold into egyptian slavery daniel in the lion's den the three hebrews in the burning fiery furnace and paul in prison and shipwreck and manifold perils and showing us their steadfastness and their final triumph he prompts us to hope in god when weakness of body overtakes us he encourages us with such assurances as these my flesh and my heart faileth but god is the strength of my heart and my portion for ever psalm seventy three twenty six and the words of paul though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day two corinthians four sixteen when old age comes creeping on apace he has promised to meet the need that our hope fail not listen to david he prays cast me not off in the time of old age forsake me not when my strength faileth now also when i am old and gray-headed o god forsake me not until i have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to every one that is to come psalm seventy one nine eighteen and through isaiah the lord replies even to your old age i am he and even to hoar hairs will i carry you i have made and i will bear even i will carry and will deliver you isaiah forty six four and david cries out the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree he shall grow like a cedar in lebanon those that be planted in the house of the lord shall flourish in the courts of our god they shall bring forth fruit in old age they shall be fat and flourishing to show that the lord is upright psalm ninety two twelve to fifteen these are the sample promises of which the bible is full and which have been adapted by infinite wisdom and love to meet us at every point of doubt and fear and need that in believing them we may have a steadfast and glad hope in god he is pledged to help us he says fear thou not for i am with thee be not dismayed for i am thy god i will strengthen thee yea i will help thee yea i will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness isaiah forty one ten when all god's waves and billows seemed to sweep over david and his soul was bowed within him three times he cried out why art thou cast down o my soul why art thou disquieted in me hope thou in god for i shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance psalm forty two five and jeremiah remembering the wormwood in the gall and the deep mire of the dungeon into which they had plunged him and from which he had scarcely been delivered said it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the lord lamentations three twenty six when the holy spirit is come he brings to remembrance these precious promises and makes them living words and if we believe the whole heaven of our soul shall be lighted up with abounding hope hallelujah it is only through ignorance of god's promises 
or through weak and wavering faith that hope is dimmed oh that we may heed the still small voice of the heavenly comforter and steadfastly joyously believe my hope is built on nothing less than jesus's blood and righteousness when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay have ye received the holy ghost since ye believed end of chapter ten chapter eleven of when the holy ghost is come this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen when the holy ghost is come by samuel logan bringle chapter eleven the holy spirit substitute for gossip and evil speaking you shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you the other day i heard a man of god say we cannot bridle the tongues of the people among whom we live they will talk and by talk he meant gossip and criticism and fault-finding you never can tell when you send a word like an arrow shot from a bow by an archer blind be it cruel or kind just where it will chance to go it may pierce the breast of your dearest friend tipped with its poison or balm to a stranger's heart in life's great mart it may carry its pain or its calm the wise mother when she finds her little boy playing with a sharp knife or the looking-glass or some dainty dish does not snatch it away with a slap on his cheek or harsh words but quietly and gently substitutes a safer and more interesting toy and so avoids a storm a sensible father who finds his boy reading a book of dangerous tendency will kindly point out its character and substitute a better book that is equally interesting when children want to spend their evenings on the street thoughtful and intelligent parents will seek to make their evenings at home more healthfully attractive when a man seeks to rid his mind of evil and hurtful thoughts he will find it wise to follow paul's exhortation to the philippians brethren whatsoever things are true honest just pure lovely of good report if there be any praise think on these things philippians four eight any man who faithfully patiently and persistently accepts this program of paul's will find his evil thoughts vanishing away and this is the holy spirit's method he has a pleasant and safe substitute for gossip and fault-finding and slander here it is be filled with the spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the lord giving thanks always for all things unto god and the father in the name of our lord jesus christ ephesians five eighteen to twenty this is certainly a fruit of being filled with the spirit many years ago the lord gave me a blessed revival in a little village in which nearly every soul in the place as well as farmers from the surrounding country were converted one result was that they now had no time for gossip and doubtful talk about their neighbors they were all talking about religion and rejoicing in the things of the lord if they met each other on the street or in some shop or store they praised the lord and encouraged each other to press on in the heavenly way if they met a sinner they tenderly besought him to be reconciled to god to give up his sins flee from the wrath to come and start at once for heaven if they met in each other's houses they gathered around the organ or the piano and sang hymns and songs and did not part till they had united in prayer there was no criticizing of their neighbors no grumbling and complaining about the weather no fault-finding with their lot in life or their daily surroundings and circumstances their conversation was joyous cheerful and helpful to one another nor was it forced and out of place but rather it was the natural spontaneous outflow of loving humble glad hearts filled with the spirit in union with jesus and in love and sympathy with their fellow-men and this is i think our heavenly father's ideal of social and spiritual intercourse for his children on earth he would not have us separate ourselves from each other and shut ourselves up in convents and monasteries in austere asceticism on the one hand nor would he have us light and foolish or fault-finding and censorious on the other hand but sociable cheerful and full of tender 
considerate love on the day of pentecost when they were all filled with the holy ghost and a multitude were converted we read that they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising god and having favor with all the people acts two forty six forty seven this is a sample of the brotherly love and unity which our heavenly father would have throughout the whole earth but how the breath of gossip and evil speaking would have marred this heavenly fellowship and separated these chief friends lord subdue our selfish will each to each our tempers suit by thy modulating skill heart to heart as lute to lute let no one suppose however that the holy spirit accomplishes this heavenly work by some overwhelming baptism which does away with the need of our cooperation he does not override us but works with us and we must intelligently and determinedly work with him in this manner people often fall into idle and hurtful gossip and evil speaking not so much from ill-will as from old habit as a wagon falls into a rut or they drift into it with the current of conversation about them or they are beguiled into it by a desire to say something and be pleasant and entertaining but when the holy spirit comes he lifts us out of the old ruts and we must follow him with care lest we fall into them again possibly never more to escape he gives us life and power to stem the adverse currents about us but we must exercise ourselves not to be swept downward by them he does not destroy the desire to please but he subordinates it to the desire to help and bless and we must stir ourselves up to do this when miss havergal was asked to sing and play before a worldly company she sang a sweet song about jesus and without displeasing anybody greatly blessed the company at a breakfast party john fletcher told his experience so sweetly and naturally that all hearts were stirred the holy ghost fell upon the company and they ended with a glorious prayer meeting william bramwell used at meals to steadily and persistently turn the conversation into spiritual channels to the blessing of all who were present so that they had two meals one for the body and one for the soul to do this wisely and helpfully requires thought and prayer and a fixed purpose and a tender loving heart filled with the holy spirit i know a mother who seeks to have a brief season of prayer and a text of scripture just before going to dinner to prepare her heart to guide the conversation along spiritual highways are you careful and have you victory in this matter my comrade if not seek it just now in simple trustful prayer and the lord who loves you will surely answer and will be your helper from this time forth he surely will believe just now and henceforth let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of christ i ask thee ever blessed lord that i may never speak a word of envy born or passion stirred first true to thee in heart and mind then always to my neighbor kind be thy good hand to good inclined oh save from words that bear a sting that pain to any brother bring in breathe thy calm in everything let love within my heart prevail to rule my words when thoughts assail that hide in thee i may not fail i know my lord thy power within can save from all the power of sin in thee let every word begin should i be silent keep me still glad waiting on my master's will thy message through my lips fulfil give me thy words when i should speak for words of thine are never weak but break the proud but raise the meek into thy lips all grace is poured speak thou through me eternal word of thought of heart of lips the lord have ye received the holy ghost since ye believed end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of when the holy ghost is come this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen when the holy ghost is come by samuel logan bringle chapter twelve the sin against the holy ghost 
ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you god is love and the holy spirit is ceaselessly striving to make this love known in our hearts work out god's purposes of love in our lives and transform and transfigure our character by love and so we are solemnly warned against resisting the spirit and almost tearfully and always tenderly exhorted to quench not the spirit and to grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby says the apostle ye are sealed unto the day of redemption there is one great sin against which jesus warned the jews as a sin never to be forgiven in this world nor in that which is to come that was blasphemy against the holy ghost that there is such a sin jesus teaches in matthew thirteen thirty one thirty two mark three twenty eight to thirty and luke twelve ten and it may be that this is the sin referred to in hebrews six four to six ten twenty nine since many of god's dear children have fallen into dreadful distress through fear that they have committed this sin it may be helpful for us to study carefully as to what constitutes it jesus was casting out devils and mark tells us that the scribes which came down from jerusalem said he hath beelzebub and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils to this jesus replied with gracious kindness and searching logic how can satan cast out satan and if a kingdom be divided against itself that kingdom cannot stand and if a house be divided against itself it cannot stand and if satan rise up against himself and be divided he cannot stand but hath an end no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house in this quiet reply we see that jesus does not rail against them nor flatly deny their base assertion that he does his miracles by the power of the devil but shows how logically false must be their statement and then with grave authority and i think with solemn tenderness in his voice and in his eyes he adds verily i say unto you all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme but he that shall blaspheme against the holy ghost hath never forgiveness but is in danger of eternal damnation or as the revised version puts it is guilty of an eternal sin and then mark adds because they said he hath an unclean spirit mark three twenty two to thirty jesus came into the world to reveal god's truth and love to men and to save them and men are saved by believing in him but how could the men of his day who saw him working at the carpenter's bench and living the life of an ordinary man of humble toil and daily temptation and trial believe his stupendous claim to be the only begotten son of god the saviour of the world and the final judge of all men any wilful and proud impostor could make such a claim but men could not and ought not to believe such an assertion unless the claim were supported by ungainsayable evidence this evidence jesus began to give not only in the holy life which he lived and the pure gospel he preached but in the miracles he wrought the blind eyes he opened the sick he healed the hungry thousands he fed the seas he stilled the dead he raised to life again and the devils he cast out of bound and harassed souls the scribes and pharisees witnessed these miracles and were compelled to admit these signs and wonders nicodemus one of their number said to jesus rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from god for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except god be with him john three two would they now admit his claim to be the son of god their promised and long looked for messiah they were thoughtful men and very religious but not spiritual the gospel he preached was spirit and life it appealed to their conscience and revealed their sin and to acknowledge him was to admit that they themselves were wrong it meant submission to his authority the surrender of their wills and a change of front in their whole inner and outer life this meant moral and spiritual revolution in each man's heart and life and to this they would not submit and so to avoid such plain inconsistency 
they must discredit his miracles and since they could not deny them they declared that he wrought them by the power of the devil jesus worked these signs and wonders by the power of the holy spirit that he might win their confidence and that they might reasonably believe and be saved but they refused to believe and in their malignant obstinacy heaped scorn upon him accusing him of being in league with the devil and how could they be saved this was the sin against the holy spirit against which jesus warned them it was not so much one act of sin as a deep-seated stubborn rebellion against god that led them to choose darkness rather than light and so to blaspheme against the spirit of truth and light it was sin full and ripe and ready for the harvest some one has said that this sin cannot be forgiven not because god is unwilling to forgive but because one who thus sins against the holy spirit has put himself where no power can soften his heart or change his nature a man may misuse his eyes and yet see but whosoever puts them out can never see again one may misdirect his compass and turn it aside from the north pole by a magnet or piece of iron and it may recover and point right again but whosoever destroys the compass itself has lost his guide at sea many of god's dear children honest souls have been persuaded that they have committed this awful sin indeed i once thought that i myself had done so and for twenty-eight days i felt that like jonah i was in the belly of hell but god in love and tender mercy drew me out of the horrible pit of doubt and fear and showed me that this is a sin committed only by those who in spite of all evidence harden their hearts in unbelief and to shield themselves in their sins deny and blaspheme the lord dr daniel steele tells of a jew who was asked is it that you cannot or that you will not believe the jew passionately replied we will not we will not believe this was wilful refusal and rejection of light and in that direction lies hardness of heart beyond recovery fullness of sin and final impenitence which are unpardonable doubtless many through resistance to the holy spirit come to this awful state of heart but those troubled anxious souls who think they have committed this sin are not usually among the number an army officer in canada was in the midst of a glorious revival when one night a gentle man arose and with deep emotion urged the young people present to yield themselves to god accept jesus as their saviour and receive the holy spirit he told them that he had once been a christian but that he had not walked in the light and consequently had sinned against the holy spirit and could never more be pardoned then with all earnest tenderness he exhorted them to be warned by his sad state and not to harden their hearts against the gracious influences and entreated them to yield to the saviour suddenly the scales of doubt dropped from his eyes and he saw that he had not in his inmost heart rejected jesus that he had not committed the unpardonable sin that the love of god is broader than the measure of man's mind and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind and in an instant his heart was filled with light and love and peace and sweet assurance that christ jesus was his saviour even his in one meeting i have known three people who thought they had committed this sin and were bowed with grief and fear to come to the penitent form and find deliverance the poet cowper was plunged into unutterable gloom by the conviction that he had committed this awful sin but god tenderly brought him into the light and sweet comforts of the holy spirit again and doubtless it was in the sense of such loving kindness that he wrote there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains john bunyan was also afflicted with horrible fears that he had committed the unpardonable sin and in his little book entitled grace abounding to the chief of sinners a book which i would earnestly recommend to all soul winners he tells how he was delivered from his doubts and fears and was filled once more with the joy of the lord there are portions of his pilgrim's progress which are to be interpreted in the light of this grievous experience those who think they have committed this sin may generally be assured that they have not one their hearts are usually very tender 
while this sin must harden the heart past all feeling two they are full of sorrow and shame for having neglected god's grace and trifled with the saviour's dying words but such sorrow could not exist in a heart so fully given over to sin that pardon was impossible three god says whosoever will may come and if they find it in their hearts to come they will not be cast out but freely pardoned and received with loving kindness through the merits of jesus's blood god's promise will not fail his faithfulness is established in the heavens bless his holy name those who have committed this sin are full of evil and do not care to come and will not and therefore are never pardoned their sin is eternal have ye received the holy ghost since ye believed end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of when the holy ghost is come this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by marianne spiegel when the holy ghost is come by samuel logan brengel chapter thirteen offences against the holy ghost ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you one day in a fit of boyish temper i spoke hot words of anger somewhat unjustly against another person and this deeply grieved my mother she said but little and though her sweet face has mouldered many years beneath the southern daisies her look of grief i can still see across the years of a third of a century and that is the one sad memory of my childhood a stranger might have been amused or incensed at my words but my mother was grieved grieved to her heart by my lack of generous self-forgetful thoughtful love we can anger a stranger or an enemy but it is only a friend we grieve the holy spirit is such a friend more tender and faithful than a mother and shall we carelessly offend him and estrange ourselves from him in spite of his love there is a sense in which every sin is against the holy ghost of course not every such sin is unpardonable but the tendency of all sin is in that direction and we are only safe as we avoid the very beginnings of sin only as we walk in the spirit are we free from the law of sin and death romans chapter eight verse two therefore it is infinitely important that we beware of offences against the spirit lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin hebrews chapter three verse thirteen grieving the holy spirit is a very common and a very sad offence of professing christians and it is to this that must be attributed much of the weakness and ignorance and joylessness of so many followers of christ and he is grieved as my mother was by the unloving speech and spirit of god's children in his letter to the ephesians paul says let no corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers and then he adds and grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption let all bitterness wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another even as god for christ's sake hath forgiven you be ye therefore followers of god as dear children and walk in love as christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us ephesians chapter four verse twenty nine to chapter five verse two what does paul teach us here that it is not by some huge wickedness some judas like betrayal some tempting and lying to the holy ghost as did ananias and sapphira acts chapter five verses one to nine that we grieve him but by that which most people count little and unimportant by talk that corrupts instead of blessing and building up those that hear by gossip by bitterness and uncharitable criticisms and fault findings this was the sin of the elder son when the prodigal returned and it was by this he pierced with grief the kind old father's heart by getting in a rage by loud angry talking and evil speaking and petty malice by unkindness and hard-heartedness and an unforgiving spirit we grieve him in a word by not walking through the world as in our father's house 
and among our neighbors and friends as among his dear children by not loving tenderly and making kindly sacrifices for one another he is grieved and this is not a matter of little importance it may have sadly momentous consequences it is a bitter cruel and often an irreparable thing to trifle with a valuable earthly friendship how much more when the friendship is heavenly when the friend is our lord and saviour our creator and redeemer our governor and judge our teacher guide and god when we trifle with a friend's wishes especially when such wishes are all in perfect harmony with and for our highest possible good we may not estrange the friend from us but we estrange ourselves from our friend our hearts grow cold toward him though his heart may be breaking with longing toward us the more saul ill-treated david the more he hated david such estrangement may lead little by little to yet greater sin to strange hardness of heart to doubts and unbelief and backslidings and denial of the lord the cure for all this is a clean heart full of sweet and gentle self-forgetful generous love then we shall be followers of god as dear children then we shall walk in love as christ loved us and gave himself for us but there is another offence that of quenching the spirit which accounts for the comparative darkness and deadness of many of god's children in first thessalonians chapter five verses sixteen to nineteen the apostle says rejoice evermore pray without ceasing in everything give thanks for this is the will of god in christ jesus concerning you quench not the spirit when will the lord's dear children learn that the religion of jesus is a lowly thing and that it is the little foxes that spoil the vines does not the apostle here teach that it is not by some desperate dastardly deed that we quench the spirit but simply by neglecting to rejoice and pray and give thanks at all times and for all things it is not necessary to blot the sun out of the heavens to keep the sunlight out of your house just close the blinds and draw the curtains nor do you pour barrels of water on the flames to quench the fire just shut off the draught nor do you dynamite the city reservoir and destroy all the mains and pipes to cut off your supply of sparkling water but just refrain from turning on the main so you do not need to do some great evil some deadly sin to quench the spirit just cease to rejoice through fear of man and of being peculiar be prim and proper as a white and polished gravestone let gushing joy be curbed neglect to pray when you feel a gentle pull in your heart to get alone with the lord omit giving hearty thanks for all god's tender mercies faithful discipline and loving chastenings and soon you will find the spirit quenched he will no longer spring up joyously like a well of living water within you but give the spirit a vent an opening a chance and he will rise within you and flood your soul with light and love and joy some years ago a sanctified woman of clear experience went alone to keep her daily hour with god but to her surprise it seemed that she could not find him either in prayer or in his word she searched her heart for evidence of sin but the spirit showed her nothing contrary to god in her mind heart or will she searched her memory for any breach of covenant any broken vows any neglect any omission but could find none then she asked the lord to show her if there were any duty unfulfilled any command unnoticed which she might perform and quick as thought came the oft-read words rejoice evermore how have you done that this morning she had not it had been a busy morning and a well-spent one but so far there had been no definite rejoicing in her heart though the manifold riches and ground for joy of all christians were hers at once she began to count her blessings and thank the lord for each one and rejoice in him for all the way he had led her and the gifts he had bestowed and in a very few minutes the lord stood revealed to her spiritual consciousness she had not committed sin nor resisted the spirit but a failure to rejoice in him who had daily loaded her with benefits psalm sixty eight verse nineteen had in a measure quenched the spirit she had not turned the main and so her soul was not flooded with living waters she had not remembered the command thou shalt rejoice before the lord thy god in all that thou puttest thine hand unto but this morning she learned a lifelong lesson 
and she has ever since safeguarded her soul by obeying the many commands to rejoice in the lord grieving and quenching the spirit will not only leave barren and desolate an individual soul but it will do so for a corps a church a community a whole nation or continent we see this illustrated on a large scale by the long and weary dark ages when the light of the gospel was almost extinguished and only here and there was the darkness broken by the torch of truth held aloft by some humble suffering soul that had wept and prayed and through painful struggles had found the light we see it also in these corps churches communities and countries where revivals are unknown or are a thing of the past where souls are not born into the kingdom and where there is no joyous shout of victory among the people of god grieving and quenching the spirit may be done unintentionally by lack of thought and prayer and hearty devotion to the lord jesus but they prepare the way and lead to intentional and positive resistance to the spirit to resist the spirit is to fight against him the sinner who listening to the gospel invitation and convicted of sin refuses to submit to god in true repentance and faith in jesus is resisting the holy spirit we have bold and striking historical illustrations of the danger of resisting the holy spirit in the disasters which befell pharaoh and the terrible calamities which came upon jerusalem and have for twenty centuries followed the jews the ten plagues that came upon pharaoh and his people were ten opportunities and open doors into god's favor and fellowship which they themselves shot by their stubborn resistance only to be overtaken by dreadful catastrophe to the jews stephen said ye do always resist the holy ghost acts chapter seven verse fifty one and the siege and fall of jerusalem and the butchery and banishment and enslavement of its inhabitants and all the woes that came upon the jews followed their rejection of jesus and the hardness of heart and spiritual blindness which swiftly overtook them when they resisted all the loving efforts and entreaties of his disciples baptized with the holy spirit and what on a large scale befalls nations and people on a small scale also befalls individuals those that receive and obey the lord are enlightened and blessed and saved those that resist and reject him are sadly left to themselves and surely swallowed up in destruction likewise the professing christian who hears of heart holiness and cleansing from all sin as a blessing he may now have by faith and convicted of his need of the blessing and of god's desire and willingness to bestow it upon him now refuses to seek it in wholehearted affectionate consecration and faith is resisting the holy spirit and such resistance imperils the soul beyond all possible computation we see an example of this in the israelites who were brought out of egypt with signs and wonders and led through the red sea and the wilderness to the borders of canaan but forgetting refused to go over into the land in this they resisted the holy spirit in his leading as surely as did pharaoh and with quite as disastrous results to themselves perishing in their evil way for their sin was as much greater than his as their light exceeded his hundreds of years later isaiah writing of this time says in all their affliction he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity he redeemed them he bare them and carried them all the days of old but they rebelled and vexed his holy spirit therefore he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them isaiah chapter sixty three verses nine and ten we see from this that christians must beware and watch and pray and walk softly with the lord in glad obedience and childlike faith if they would escape the darkness and dryness that result from grieving and quenching the spirit and the dangers that surely come from resisting him arm me with jealous care as in thy sight to live and o oh, thy servant lord prepare a strict account to give help me to watch and pray and on thyself rely assured that if i my trust betray i shall for ever die have ye received the holy ghost since ye believed end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of when the holy ghost is come this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. When the Holy Ghost is Come by Samuel Logan Brengel. Chapter 14 The Holy Spirit and Sound Doctrine. 
ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you is jesus christ divine is the bible an inspired book is man a fallen creature who can only be saved through the suffering and sacrifice of the creator will there be a resurrection of the dead and a day in which god will judge all the world by the man christ jesus is satan a personal being and is there a hell in which the wicked will be for ever punished these are great doctrines which have been held and taught by his followers since the days of jesus and his apostles and yet they are ever being attacked and denied are they true or are they only fancies and falsehoods or figures of speech and distortions of truth how can we find truth and know it jesus said when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth john chapter 16 verse 13 what truth not the truth of the multiplication table or of physical science or art or secular history but spiritual truth the truth about god and his will and character and our relations to him in christ the truth which is necessary to salvation and holiness into all this truth the holy spirit will guide us he shall teach you all things said jesus john chapter 14 verse 26 how then shall we escape error and be sound in doctrine only by the help of the holy spirit how do we know jesus christ is divine because the bible tells us so infinitely precious and important is this revelation in the bible but not by this do we know it because the church teaches it in her creed and we have heard it from the catechism nothing taught in any creed or catechism is of more vital importance but neither by this do we know it how then listen to paul no man can say that jesus is the lord but the holy ghost first corinthians chapter 12 verse 3 no man says paul then learning it from the bible or catechism is not to know it except as the parrot might know it but every man is to be taught this by the holy spirit if he is to really know it then it is not a revelation made once for all and only to the men who walked and talked with jesus but it is a spiritual revelation made anew to each believing heart that in penitence seeks him and so meets the condition of such a revelation then the poor degraded ignorant outcast at the army penitent form in the slums of london or chicago who never heard of a creed and the ebony african and dusky indian who never saw the inside of a bible may have christ revealed in him and know by the revelation of the holy spirit that jesus is lord it pleased god to reveal his son in me wrote paul galatians chapter 1 verses 15 and 16 and again christ liveth in me galatians chapter 2 verse 20 and again my little children of whom i travail in birth again until christ be formed in you galatians chapter 4 verse 19 as though christ is to be spiritually formed in the heart of each believer by the operation of the holy spirit as he was physically formed in the womb of mary by the same spirit luke chapter 1 verse 35 and again the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints which is christ in you the hope of glory colossians chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith prove your own selves know ye not your own selves how that christ jesus is in you except ye be reprobates second corinthians chapter 13 verse 5 at that day said jesus when making his great promise of the comforter to his disciples at that day ye shall know that i am in my father and ye in me and i in you john chapter 14 verse 20 and again in his great prayer he said i have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and i in them it is this ever recurring revelation to penitent believing hearts by the agency of the ever-present holy spirit that makes faith in christ jesus living and invincible i know he is lord for he saves my soul from sin and he saves me now is an argument that rationalism and unbelief cannot answer nor overthrow 
and so long as there are men in the world who can say this faith in the divinity of jesus christ is secure and this experience and witness come by the holy ghost i worship thee o holy ghost i love to worship thee my risen lord for i were lost but for thy company and so it is by the guidance and teaching of the holy spirit that all saving truth becomes vital to us it is he that makes the bible a living book it is he that convinces the world of judgment john chapter 16 verses 8 to 11 it is he that makes men certain that there is a heaven of surpassing and enduring glory and joy and a hell of endless sorrow and woe for those who sin away their day of grace and die in impenitence who have been the mightiest and most faithful preachers of the gloom and terror and pain of a perpetual hell those who have been the mightiest and most effective preachers of god's compassionate love in all periods of great revival when men seemed to live on the borderland and in the vision of eternity hell has been preached the leaders in these revivals have been men of prayer and faith and consuming love but they have been men who knew the terrors of the lord and therefore they preached the judgments of god and they proved that the law with its penalties is a schoolmaster to bring men to christ galatians chapter three verse twenty four fox the quaker bunyan the baptist baxter the puritan wesley and fletcher and whitefield and coggy the methodists finney the presbyterian edwards and moody the congregationalists and general booth the salvationist have preached it not savagely but tenderly and faithfully as a mother might warn her children against some great danger that would surely follow careless and selfish wrongdoing what men have loved and labored and sacrificed as these men their hearts have been a flaming furnace of love and devotion to god and an overflowing fountain of love and compassion for men but just in proportion as they have discovered god's love and pity for the sinner so have they discovered his wrath against sin and all obstinate wrongdoing and as they have caught glimpses of heaven and declared its joys and everlasting glories to men so they have seen hell with its endless punishment and with trembling voice and overflowing eyes have they warned men to flee from the wrath to come were these men throbbing with spiritual life and consumed with devotion to the kingdom of god and the everlasting well-being of their fellow-men led to this belief by the spirit of truth or were they misled is it the prophet weeping and praying and preaching and fighting for god and men to whom the spirit has always spoken first and revealed the things of god or is it the philosopher or dry as dust theologian or the popular preacher of smooth things sitting in his study and among his books spinning out of his own mind his conceits concerning god's plan and purpose in the universe does Seneca, or the psalmist, Plato, or Paul, Rousseau, or Wesley, the idolized, high-salaried, soft, raimented preacher of a wide gate and a broad way of life to heaven, or the veteran soul-winner, General Booth, more clearly make known the mind of God in matters that are spiritual? The things of the Spirit are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, says Paul it is not by searching and philosophizing that these things are found out but by revelation flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee said jesus to peter but my father which is in heaven matthew chapter sixteen verse seventeen the great teacher of truth is the spirit of truth and the only safe expounders and guardians of sound doctrine are men filled with the holy ghost study and research have their place and an important place but in spiritual things they will be no avail unless prosecuted by spiritual men as well might men blind from birth attempt to study the starry heavens and men born deaf undertake to expound and criticize the harmonics of bach and beethoven men must see and hear to speak and write intelligently on such subjects and so men must be spiritually enlightened to understand spiritual truth the greatest danger to any religious organization is that a body of men should arise in its ranks and hold its positions of trust who have learned its great fundamental doctrines by rote out of the catechism but have no experimental knowledge of their truth inwrought by the mighty anointing of the holy ghost 
and who are destitute of an unction from the holy one by which says john ye know all things first john chapter two verses twenty and twenty seven why do men deny the divinity of jesus christ because they have never placed themselves in that relation to the spirit and met those unchanging conditions that would enable him to reveal jesus to them as saviour and lord why do men dispute the inspiration of the scriptures because the holy ghost who inspired holy men of god to write the book second peter chapter one verse twenty one hides its spiritual sense from unspiritual and unholy men why do men doubt a day of judgment and a state of everlasting doom because they have never been bowed and broken and crushed beneath the weight of their sin and by a sense of guilt and separation from a holy god that can only be removed by faith in his dying son a sportsman lost his way in a pitiless storm on a black and starless night suddenly his horse drew back and refused to take another step he urged it forward but it only threw itself back upon its haunches just then a vivid flash of lightning revealed a great precipice upon the brink of which he stood it was but an instant and then the pitchy blackness hid it again from view but he turned his horse and anxiously rode away from the terrible danger a distinguished professor of religion said to me some time ago i dislike i abhor the doctrine of hell and then after a while added but three times in my life i have seen that there was eternal separation from god and an everlasting hell for me if i walked not in the way god was calling me to go into the blackness of the sinner's night the holy spirit who is patiently and compassionately seeking the salvation of all men flashes a light that gives him a glimpse of eternal things which he did would lead to the sweet peace and security of eternal day for when the holy spirit is heeded and honored the night passes the shadows flee away the day dawns the sun of righteousness arises with healing in his wings and saved and sanctified men walk in his light in safety and joy doctrines which before were repellent to the carnal mind and but foolishness or a stumbling block to the heart of unbelief now become precious and satisfying to the soul the truths which before were hidden in impenetrable darkness or seen only as through dense gloom and fog are now seen as clearly as in the light of broad day hold thou the faith that christ is lord god over all who died and rose and everlasting life bestows on all who hear the living word for thee his life-blood he outpoured his spirit sets thy spirit free hold thou the faith he dwells in thee and thou in him and christ is lord have ye received the holy ghost since ye believed end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of when the holy ghost is come this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by marianne when the holy ghost is come by samuel logan brengel chapter fifteen praying in the spirit ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you an important work of the holy spirit is to teach us how to pray instruct us what to pray for and inspire us to pray earnestly without ceasing and in faith for the things we desire and the things that are dear to the heart of the lord in a familiar verse the poet montgomery says prayer is the burden of a sigh the falling of a tear the upward glance of the eye when none but god is near and no doubt he is right prayer is exceedingly simple the faintest cry for help a whisper for mercy is prayer but when the holy spirit comes and fills the soul with his blessed presence prayer becomes more than a cry it ceases to be a feeble request and often becomes a strife romans chapter fifteen verse thirty colossians chapter four verse twelve for greater things a conflict an invincible argument a wrestling with god and through it men enter into the divine counsels and rise into a blessed and responsible fellowship in some important sense with the father and the son in the moral government of the world it was in this spirit and fellowship that abraham prayed for sodom 
genesis chapter eighteen verses twenty three to thirty two that moses interceded for israel and stood between them and god's hot displeasure exodus chapter thirty two verses seven to fourteen and that elijah prevailed to shut up the heavens for three years and six months and then again prevailed in his prayer for rain god would have us come to him not only as a foolish and ignorant child comes but as an ambassador to his home government as a full-grown son who has become of age and entered into partnership with his father as a bride who is one in all interests and affections with the bridegroom he would have us come boldly to the throne of grace with a well-reasoned and scriptural understanding of what we desire and with a purpose to ask seek and knock till we get the things we wish being assured that it is according to his will and this boldness is not inconsistent with the profoundest humility and a sense of utter dependence indeed it is always accompanied by self-distrust and humble reliance upon the merits of jesus else it is but presumption and unsanctified conceit this union of assurance and humility of boldness and dependence can be secured only by the baptism with the holy spirit and only so can one be prepared and fitted for such prayer three great obstacles hinder mighty prayer one selfishness two unbelief three the darkness of ignorance and foolishness the baptism with the spirit sweeps away these obstacles and brings in three great essentials to prayer one faith two love divine love three the light of heavenly knowledge and wisdom one selfishness must be cast out by the incoming of love the ambassador must not be seeking personal ends but the interests of his government and the people he represents the son must not be seeking private gain but the common prosperity of the partnership in which he will fully and lawfully share the bride must not forget him to whom she belongs and seek separate ends but in all ways identify herself with her husband and his interests so the child of god must come in prayer unselfishly it is the work of the holy spirit with our cooperation and glad consent to search and destroy selfishness out of our hearts and to fill them with pure love to god and man and when this is done we shall not then be asking for things amiss to consume them upon our lusts to gratify our appetites or pride or ambition or ease or vainglory we shall seek only the glory of our lord and the common good of our fellow-men in which as co-workers and partners we shall have a common share if we ask for success it is not that we may be exalted but that god may be glorified that jesus may secure the purchase of his blood that men may be saved and the kingdom of heaven be established upon earth if we ask for daily bread it is not that we may be full but that we may be fitted for daily duty if we ask for health it is not alone that we may be free from pain and filled with physical comfort but that we may be spent in publishing the sinner's friend in fulfilling the work for which god has placed us here two unbelief must be destroyed doubt paralyzes prayer unbelief quenches the spirit of intercession only as the eye of faith sees our father god upon the throne guaranteeing to us rights and privileges by the blood of his son and inviting us to come without fear and make our wants known does prayer rise from the commonplace to the sublime does it cease to be a feeble timid cry and become a mighty spiritual force moving god himself in the interests which it seeks men wise with the wisdom of this world but poor and naked and blind and foolish in matters of faith ask will god change his plans at the request of man and we answer yes since many of god's plans are made contingent upon the prayers of his people and he has ordered that prayer offered in faith according to his will revealed in his word shall be one of the controlling factors in his government of men is it god's will that the tides of the atlantic and pacific should sweep across the isthmus of panama that men should run under the alps that thoughts and words should be winged across the ocean without any visible or tangible medium yes it is his will if men will it and work to these ends in harmony with his great physical laws so in the spiritual world there are wonders wrought by prayer and god wills the will of his people when they come to him in faith and love what else is meant by such promises and assurances as these therefore i say unto you what things soever ye desire when ye pray 
believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them mark chapter 11 verse 24 the supplication of a righteous man availeth much in its working elijah was a man of like passions with us and he prayed fervently that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth for three years and six months and he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit james chapter 5 verses 16 to 18 american revision the holy spirit dwelling within the heart helps us to understand the things we may pray for and the heart that is full of love and loyalty to god only wants what is lawful this is mystery to people who are under the dominion of selfishness and the darkness of unbelief but it is a soul-thrilling fact to those who are filled with the holy ghost what wilt thou that i should do unto thee asked jesus of the blind man luke chapter eighteen verse forty one he had respect to the will of the blind man and granted his request seeing he had faith and he still has respect to the vigorous sanctified will of his people the will that has been subdued by consecration and faith into loving union with his will the lord answered abraham on behalf of sodom till he ceased to ask the lord has had his way so long with hudson taylor said a friend that now hudson taylor can have his way with the lord adoniram judson lay sick with a fatal illness in faraway burma his wife read to him an account of the conversion of a number of jews in constantinople through some of his writings for a while the sick man was silent and then he spoke with awe telling his wife that for years he had prayed that he might be used in some way to bless the jews yet never having seen any evidence that his prayers were answered but now after many years and from far away the evidence of answer had come and then after further silence he spoke with deep emotion saying that he had never prayed a prayer for the glory of god and the good of men but that sooner or later even though for the time being he had forgotten he found that god had not forgotten but had remembered and patiently worked to answer his prayer oh the faithfulness of god he means it when he makes promises and exhorts and urges and commands us to pray it is not his purpose to mock us but to answer and to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think bless his holy name three knowledge and wisdom must take the place of foolish ignorance paul says we know not what we should pray for as we ought and then adds but the spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered romans chapter eight verse twenty six if my little child asks for a glittering razor i refuse its request but when my full-grown son asks for one i grant it so god cannot wisely answer some prayers for they are foolish or untimely hence we need not love and faith only but wisdom and knowledge that we may ask according to the will of god it is this that paul has in mind when he says that he will not only pray with the spirit but i will pray with the understanding also first corinthians chapter fourteen verse fifteen men should think before they pray and study that they may pray wisely now when the holy spirit comes there pours into the soul not only a tide of love and simple faith but a flood of light as well and prayer becomes not only earnest but intelligent also and this intelligence increases as under the leadership of the holy spirit the word of god is studied and its heavenly truths and principles are grasped and assimilated it is thus men come to know god and become his friends whose prayers he will assist and will not deny such men talk with god as friend with friend and the holy spirit helps their infirmities encourages them to urge their prayer and faith teaches them to reason with god enables them to come boldly in the name of jesus when oppressed with a sense of their own insignificance and unworthiness and when words fail them and they scarcely know how to voice their desires he intercedes within them with unutterable groanings according to the will of god romans chapter eight verses twenty six and twenty seven first corinthians chapter two verse eleven a young man felt called to mission work in china but his mother offered strong opposition to his going an agent of the mission knowing the need of the work and vexed with the mother one day laid the case before hudson taylor mr taylor said he listened patiently and lovingly to all i had to say and then gently suggested our praying about it such a prayer i have never heard before it seemed to me more like a conversation with a trusted friend whose advice he was seeking he talked the matter over with the friend from every point of view 
from the side of the young man from the side of china's needs from the side of the mother and her natural feelings and also from my side it was a revelation to me i saw that prayer did not mean merely asking for things much less asking for things to be carried out by god according to our ideas but that it means communion fellowship partnership with our heavenly father and when our will is really blended with his what liberty we may have in asking for what we want hallelujah my soul ask what thou wilt thou canst not be too bold since his own blood for thee he spilt what else can he withhold have ye received the holy ghost since ye believed end of chapter 15Chapter 16 of When the Holy Ghost is Come. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. When the Holy Ghost is Come by Samuel Logan Bringle. Chapter 16 Characteristics of the Anointed Preacher. Since God saves men by the foolishness of preaching, the preacher has an infinitely important work, and he must be fitted for it. But what can fit a man for such sacred work? Not education alone, not knowledge of books, nor gifts of speech, not winsome manners, nor a magnetic voice, nor a commanding presence, but only God. The preacher must be more than a man. He must be a man plus the Holy Ghost. Paul was such a man, who is full of the Holy Ghost, and in studying his life and ministry, we get a life-size portrait of an anointed preacher, living, fighting, preaching, praying, suffering, triumphing, and dying in the power and light and glory of the indwelling Spirit. In the second chapter of the first of Thessalonians, he gives us a picture of his character and ministry, which were formed and inspired by the Holy Spirit, a sample of his workmanship and an example for all gospel preachers. At Philippi he had been terribly beaten with stripes on his bare back, and roughly thrust into the inner dungeon, and his feet were made fast in the stocks. But that did not break nor quench his spirit. Love burned in his heart, and his joy in the Lord brimmed full and bubbled over, and at midnight in the damp, dark, loathsome dungeon, he and Silas, his comrade in service and suffering, prayed and sang praises unto God. God answered with an earthquake, and the jailer in his household got gloriously converted. Paul was set free and went at once to Thessalonica, where, regardless of the shameful way he had been treated at Philippi, he preached the gospel boldly, and a blessed revival followed with many converts. But persecution arose, and Paul had again to flee. His heart, however, was continually turning back to these converts, and at last he sat down and wrote them this letter. From this we learn that, one, he was a joyful preacher. He was no pessimist, croaking out doleful prophecies and lamentations and bitter criticisms. He was full of the joy of the Lord. It was not the joy that comes from good health, a pleasant home, plenty of money, wholesome food, numerous and smiling friends, and sunny, favoring skies but a deep, springing fountain of solemn, gladdening joy that abounded and overflowed in pain and weariness, in filthy, noisome surroundings, in loneliness and poverty, and danger and bitter persecutions. No earth-born trial could quench it, for it was heaven-born. It was the joy of the Lord, poured into his heart with the Holy Spirit. 2. He was a bold preacher. Worldly prudence would have constrained him to go softly at Thessalonica, after his experience at Philippi, lest he arouse opposition and meet again with personal violence. But instead, he says, We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Personal considerations were all forgotten, or cast to the winds, in his impetuous desire to declare the gospel and save their souls. He lived in the will of God and conquered his fears. The wicked are fearful and flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. 
This boldness is a fruit of righteousness, and is always found in those who are full of the Holy Ghost. They forget themselves, and so lose all fear. This was the secret of the martyrs when burned at the stake, or thrown to the wild beasts. Fear is a fruit of selfishness. Boldness thrives when selfishness is destroyed. God esteems it, commands his people to be courageous, and makes spiritual leaders only of those who possess courage. Joshua 1.9 Moses feared not the wrath of the king, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and boldly espoused the cause of his despised and enslaved people. Joshua was full of courage. Gideon fearlessly attacked 120,000 Midianites with but 300 unarmed men. Jonathan and his armor-bearer charged the Philistine garrison and routed hundreds single-handed. David faced the lion and the bear and inspired all Israel by battling with and killing Goliath. The prophets were men of the highest courage, who fearlessly rebuked kings, and at the risk of life and often at the cost of life, denounced popular sins and called the people back to righteousness and the faithful service of God. These men feared God and so lost the fear of man. They believed God, and so obeyed him, and found his favor, and were entrusted with his high missions and everlasting employments. Fear thou not, for I am with thee, saith the Lord. And this Paul believed, and so says, We were bold in our God. God was his high tower, his strength and unfailing defense, and so he was not afraid. His boldness toward man was a fruit of his boldness toward God, and that in turn was a fruit of his faith in Jesus as his high priest, who had been touched with the feeling of his infirmities, and through whom he could come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. It is the timidity and delicacy with which men attempt God's work that often accounts for their failure. Let them speak out boldly like men, as ambassadors of heaven, who are not afraid to represent their king, and they will command attention and respect, and reach the hearts and consciences of men. I have read that quaint old Bishop Latimer, who was afterwards burned at the stake, having preached a sermon before King Henry the Eighth, which greatly displeased the monarch, was ordered to preach again on the next Sunday, and make apology for the offense given. The day came and with it a crowded assembly anxious to hear the bishop's apology. Reading his text, he commenced thus, Hugh Latimer, dost thou know before whom thou art this day to speak? To the high and mighty monarch, the king's most excellent majesty. Who can take away thy life that thou offendest? Therefore take heed that thou speakest not a word that may displease. But then consider well, Hugh, dost thou not know from whence thou comest? upon whose message thou art sent, even by the great and mighty God, who is all-present, and who beholdeth all thy ways, and who is able to cast thy soul into hell. Therefore take care that thou deliver thy message faithfully. He then repeated the sermon of the previous Sunday, word for word, but with double its former energy and emphasis. The court was full of excitement to learn what would be the fate of this plain-dealing and fearless bishop. He was ordered into the king's presence, who with a stern voice asked, How dare do you thus offend me? I merely discharge my duty, was Latimer's reply. The king arose from his seat, embraced the good man, saying, Blessed be to God, I have so honest a servant. He was a worthy successor of Nathan who confronted King David with his sin, and said, Thou art the man. This divine courage will surely accompany the fiery baptism of the Spirit. What is it but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that gives courage to Salvation Army officers and soldiers, enabling them to face danger and difficulty and loneliness with joy, and attack sin in its worst forms as fearlessly as David attacked Goliath? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Shall I, for fear of feeble man, the spirit's course in me restrain? Awed by mortal's frown, shall I conceal the word of God most high? 
shall i to soothe the unholy throng soften thy truth or smooth my tongue how then before thee shall i dare to stand or how thine anger bear yea let men rage since thou wilt spread thy shadowing wings round my head since in all pain thy tender love will still my sure refreshment prove three he was without guile for our exhortation was not of deceit nor of uncleanness nor in guile but as we were allowed of god to be put in trust with the gospel even so we speak not as pleasing men but god which trieth our hearts he was frank and open he spoke right out of his heart he was transparently simple and straightforward since god had honored him with this infinite trust of preaching the gospel he sought to preach it that he should please god regardless of men and yet that is the surest way to please men people who listen to such a man feel his honesty and realize that he is speaking to do them good to save them rather than to tickle their ears and win their applause and in their hearts they are pleased but anyway whether or not they are pleased he is to deliver his message as an ambassador and look to his home government for his reward he gets his commission from god and it is god who will try his heart and prove his ministry oh to please jesus oh to stand perfect before god after preaching his gospel four he was not a time server nor a covetous man neither at any time use we flattering words as ye know nor a cloak of covetousness god is witness he adds there are three ways of reaching a man's purse one directly two by way of his head with flattering words three by way of his heart with manly honest saving words the first way is robbery the second way is robbery with the poison of a deadly but pleasing opiate added which may damn his soul the third reaches his purse by saving his soul and opening in his heart an unfailing fountain of benevolence to bless himself and the world it were better for a preacher to turn highwayman and rob men with a club and a strong hand than with smiles and smooth words and feigned and fawning affection to rob them with flattery while their poor souls neglected and deceived go down to hell how will he meet them in the day of judgment and look into their horror-stricken faces realizing that he played and toyed with their fancies and affections and pride to get money and instead of faithfully warning them and seeking to save them with flattering words fattened their souls for destruction not so did paul i seek not yours but you he wrote the corinthians it was not their money but their souls he wanted but such faithful love will be able to command all men have to give why to some of his converts he wrote i bear you record that if it had been possible ye would have plucked out your own eyes and had given them to me galatians four fifteen but he sought not to please them with flattering words only to save them so faithful was he in this matter and so conscious of his integrity that he called god himself into the witness box god is witness says he blessed is the man who can call on god to witness for him and that man in whom the holy spirit dwells in fullness can do this can you my brother five he was not vainglorious nor dictatorial nor oppressive some men care nothing for money but they care mightily for power and place and the glory that men give but paul was free from this spiritual itching listen to him nor of men sought we glory neither of you nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome or used authority as the apostles of christ said solomon for men to seek their own glory is not glory it is only vainglory how can ye believe which receive honour one of another and seek not the honour that cometh from god only asked jesus from all this paul was free and so in every man who is full of the holy ghost and it is only as we are thus free that with the whole heart and with a single eye we can devote ourselves to the work of saving men six with all his boldness and faithfulness he was gentle 
we were gentle among you he says as a nurse cherisheth her children the fierce hurricane which casts down the giant trees of the forest is not so mighty as the gentle sunshine which from tiny seeds and acorns lifts aloft the towering spires of oak and fir on a thousand hills and mountains the wild storm that lashes the sea into foam and fury is feeble compared to the gentle yet immeasurably powerful influence which twice a day swings the oceans in resistless tide from shore to shore and as in the physical world the mighty powers are gentle in their vast workings so it is in the spiritual world the light that falls on the lids of the sleeping infant and wakes it from its slumber is not more gentle than the still small voice that brings assurance of forgiveness or cleansing to them that look unto jesus oh the gentleness of god thy gentleness hath made me great said david i beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of christ second corinthians ten one wrote paul and again the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness galatians five twenty two and as the father son and holy ghost are gentle so will be the servant of the lord who is filled with the spirit i shall never forget the gentleness of a mighty man of god whom i well knew who on the platform was clothed with zeal as with a garment and in his overwhelming earnestness was like a lion or a consuming fire but when dealing with a wounded or broken heart or with a seeking soul no nurse with a little babe could be more tender than he seven finally paul was full of self-forgetful self-sacrificing love so being affectionately desirous of you we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of god only but also our own souls because ye were dear unto us no wonder he shook those heathen cities overthrew their idols had great revivals that his jailer was converted and that his converts would have gladly plucked out their eyes for him such tender self-sacrificing love compels attention begets confidence and enkindles love and surely wins its object this burning love led him to labor and sacrifice and so live and walk before them that he was not only a teacher but an example of all he taught and could safely say follow me this love led him to preach the whole truth that he might by all means save them he kept back no truth because it was unpopular for it was their salvation and not his own reputation and popularity he sought he preached not himself but a crucified christ without the shedding of whose blood there is no remission of sins and through that precious blood he preached present cleansing from all sin and the gift of the holy spirit to all who obediently believe and this love kept him faithful and humble and true to the end so that at last in sight of the martyr's death he saw the martyr's crown and cried out i am now ready to be offered i have fought a good fight i have finished my course i have kept the faith henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day he had been faithful and now at the end he was oppressed with no doubts and harassed with no bitter regrets but looked forward with eager joy to meeting his lord and beholding the blessed face of him he loved hallelujah have ye received the holy ghost twill fit you for the fight twill make of you a mighty host to put your foes to flight have you received the holy power twill fall from heaven on you from jesus throne this very hour twill make you brave and true oh now receive the holy fire twill burn away all dross all earthly selfish vain desire twill make you love the cross end of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of When the Holy Ghost Has Come. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. When the Holy Ghost Has Come by Samuel Logan Brindle. Chapter Seventeen Preaching. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? where is the disputer of this world 
hath not god made foolish the wisdom of this world ask paul and then he declares after that in the wisdom of god the world by wisdom knew not god it pleased god by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe what kind of preaching is this he does not say foolish preaching but the foolishness of such a way as that of preaching certainly it is not the moral essay or the intellectual or semi-intellectual kind of preaching that is most generally heard throughout the world to-day that is to save men for thousands of such sermons move and convert no one nor is it a mere noisy declamation called a sermon noisy because empty of all earnest thought and true feeling but it must be the kind of which peter speaks when he writes of them that preach the gospel with the holy ghost sent down from heaven first peter one twelve no man is equipped who rightly preach the gospel and undertake the spiritual oversight and instruction of souls till he has been anointed with the holy ghost the disciples have been led to jesus by john the baptist whose mighty preaching laid a deep and broad foundation for their spiritual education and then for three years they had listened to both the public and private teachings of jesus they had been eyewitnesses of his glory of his life and death and resurrection and yet he commanded them to tarry in jerusalem and wait for the holy spirit he was to fit them for ministry and if they trained and taught by the master himself had need of the holy spirit to enable them to preach and testify with wisdom and power how much more do you and i need his presence without him they could do nothing with him they were invincible and could continue the work of jesus the mighty energy of his working is seen in the preaching of peter on the day of pentecost the sermon itself does not seem to have been very remarkable indeed it is principally composed of testimony backed up and fortified by scripture quotations followed by exhortation just as are the sermons that are most effective today in the immediate conversion and sanctification of men true preaching says horace bushnell is a testimony peter's scripture quotations were apt fitting the occasion and the people to whom they were addressed the testimony was bold and joyous the rushing outflow of a warm fresh throbbing experience and the exhortation was burning uncompromising in its demands and yet tender and full of sympathy and love but a divine presence was at work in that vast mocking wondering throng and it was he who made peter's simple words search like fire and carry such overwhelming conviction to the hearts of the people and it is still so that whenever and wherever a man preaches with the holy ghost sent down from heaven there will be conviction under peter's sermon they were pricked in their hearts the truth pierced them as a sword until they said what shall we do they had been doubting and mocking a short time before but now they were earnestly inquiring the way to be saved the speech may be without polish the manner uncouth and the matter simple and plain but conviction will surely follow any preaching and the burning love and power and contagious joy of the holy spirit a few years ago a poor black boy in africa who had been stolen for a slave and most cruelly treated heard a missionary talking of the indwelling of the holy spirit and his heart hungered and thirsted for him in a strange manner he worked his way to new york to find out more about the holy spirit getting the captain of the ship and several of the crew converted on the way the brother in new york to whom he came took him to a meeting the first night he was in the city he left him there while he went to fulfill another engagement when he returned at a late hour he found a crowd of men at the penitent form led there by the simple words of this poor black fellow he took him to his sunday school and put him up to speak while he attended to some other matters when he turned from these affairs that had occupied his attention for only a little while he found the penitent form full of teachers and scholars weeping before the lord what the black boy had said he did not know but he was bowed with wonder and filled with joy for it was the power 
of the Holy Spirit. Men used to fall as though cut down in battle under the preaching of Wesley, Whitfield, Finney, and others. And while there may not be the same physical manifestations at all times, there will surely be the same opening of eyes to spiritual things, breaking of hearts and piercing of consciences. The spirit under the preaching of a man filled with the Holy Ghost will often come upon a congregation like a wind, and heads will droop, eyes will brim with tears, and hearts will break under his convicting power. I remember a proud young woman who had been mercilessly criticizing us for several nights smitten in this way. She was smiling when suddenly the Holy Spirit winged a word to her heart, and instantly her countenance changed. Her head drooped, and for an hour or more she sobbed and struggled while her proud heart broke, and she found her way with true repentance and faith to the feet of Jesus and her Heavenly Father's favor. How often have we seen such sights as this under the preaching of the general, and it ought to be a common sight under the preaching of all servants of God, for what are we sent for but to convict men of their sin and their need, and by the power of the Spirit lead them to the Savior? And not only will there be conviction under such preaching, but generally, if not always, there will be conversion and sanctification. Three thousand people accepted Christ under Peter's Pentecostal sermon, and later five thousand were converted, and a multitude of the priests were obedient to the faith, and it was so under the preaching of Philip in Samaria, of Peter in Lydda and Saron and in Caesarea, and of Paul in Ephesus and other cities. To be sure, the preaching of Stephen, in its immediate effect, only resulted in enraging his hearers until they stoned him to death. But it is highly probable that the ultimate result was the conversion of Paul, who kept the clothes of those who stoned him, and through Paul, the evangelization of the Gentiles. One of the greatest American evangelists sought with agonizing prayers and tears the baptism with the Holy Spirit and received it and then he said he preached the same sermons. But where before it had been as one beating the air, now hundreds were saved. It is this that has made Salvation Army officers successful, young, inexperienced, without special gifts and without learning. But with the baptism, they have been mighty to win souls. The hardest hearts have been broken, the darkest minds illuminated, the most stubborn wills subdued and the wildest natures tamed by them. Their words have been with power, and have convicted and converted and sanctified men, and whole communities have been transformed by their labors. But without this presence, great gifts and profound and accurate learning are without avail in the salvation of men. We often see men with great natural powers, splendidly trained and equipped with everything save this fiery baptism, and they labor and preach year after year without seeing a soul saved. They have spent years in study, but they have not spent a day, much less ten days, fasting and praying and waiting upon God for His anointing that should fill them with heavenly wisdom and power for their work. They are like a great gun loaded and primed, but without a spark of fire to turn the powder and ball into a resistless lightning bolt. It is fire men need and that they get from God in agonizing, wrestling, listening prayer that will not be denied. And when they get it, and not till then, will they preach with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, and surely men shall be saved. Such preaching is not foolish. The Holy Spirit makes the word alive. He brings it to the remembrance of the preachers in whom he abides, and he applies it to the heart of the hearers, lightening up the soul with a sun until sin is seen in all its hideousness, or cutting as a sharp sword, piercing the heart with resistless conviction of the guilt and shame of sin. Peter had no time to consult the scriptures and prepare a sermon on the morning of Pentecost, but the Holy Spirit quickened his memory and brought to his mind the scriptures appropriate to the occasion. Hundreds of years before the Holy Spirit by the mouth of the prophet Joel, had foretold that in the last days the Spirit should be poured out upon all flesh, and that their sons and daughters should prophesy. And the same Spirit that spoke through Joel 
now made peter to see and declare that this pentecostal baptism was that of which joel spoke by the mouth of david he had said thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption and now peter by the inspiration of the same spirit applies this scripture to the resurrection of jesus and so proves to the jews that the one they had condemned and killed was the holy one foretold in prophecy and psalm and so today the holy spirit inspires men who receive him to use the scriptures to awaken convict and save men when finney was a young preacher he was invited to a country schoolhouse to preach on the way there he became much distressed in soul and his mind seemed blank and dark when all at once this text spoken to lot in sodom by the angels came to his mind up get you out of this place for the lord will destroy this city he explained the text told the people about lot and the wickedness of sodom and applied it to them while he spoke they began to look exceedingly angry and then as he earnestly exhorted them to give up their sins and seek the lord they began to fall from their seats as though stricken down in battle and to cry to god for mercy a great revival followed many were converted and a number of converts became ministers of the gospel to finney's amazement he learned afterwards that the place was called sodom because of its extreme wickedness and the old man who had invited him to preach was called lot because he was the only god-fearing man in the place evidently the holy spirit worked through finney to accomplish these results and such inspiration is not uncommon with those who are filled with the spirit but this reinforcement of the mind and memory by the holy spirit does not do away with the need of study the spirit quickens that which is already in the mind and memory as the warm sun and rains of spring quicken the sleeping seeds that are in the ground and only those the sun does not put the seed in the soil nor does the holy spirit without our attention and study put the word of god in our minds for that we should perfectly and patiently study we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word said the apostles study to show thyself approved of god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth wrote paul to timothy those men have been best able to rightly divide the word and have been most mightily used by the holy spirit who have most carefully and prayerfully studied the word of god and most constantly and lovingly meditated upon it this preaching is healing and comforting preaching with the holy ghost sent down from heaven is indescribably searching in its effects but it is also edifying strengthening comforting to those who are holy the lord's it cuts but only to cure it searches but only to save it is constructive as well as destructive it tears down sin and pride and unbelief but it builds up faith and righteousness and holiness and all the graces of a christian character it warms the heart with love strengthens faith and confirms the will in all holy purposes every preacher baptized with the holy ghost can say with jesus the spirit of the lord god is upon me because the lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he hath sent me to bind up the broken-hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the lord and the day of vengeance of our god to comfort all that mourn seldom is there a congregation in which there are only those who need to be convicted there will also be meek and gentle ones to whom should be brought a message of joy and good tidings broken-hearted ones to be bound up wounded ones to heal tempted ones to be delivered and those whom satan has bound by some fear or habit to be set free and the holy spirit who knows all hearts will inspire the word that shall bless these needy ones the preacher filled with the holy spirit who is instant in prayer constant in the study of god's word and steadfast and active in faith will surely be so helped that he can say with isaiah the lord hath given me the tongue of the learned 
so I shall know how to speak the word in season to him that is weary. Isaiah 1 4. And as with little Samuel, the Lord will let none of his words fall to the ground. 1 Samuel 3 19. He will expect results, and God will make them follow his preaching as surely as corn follows the planting and cultivating of the farmer. End of chapter 17